A lot of Christians get seduced by it because you see, they come along and they say, so, so you don't love trans people? You don't love homosexuals? You don't think they deserve rights? And I think the average Christian goes, well, I mean, I believe in rights. I believe in freedom. I believe in love. Love wins. I believe in that. You know, I've spent my career taking on some of the cultural baddies, you know, some of the most prominent intellectuals in the world, some of them in public debates, some of them behind the scenes. And I've come to realize that ideas define everything that we do. With an academic degree, you're trained to be a researcher and writer to the point that it's annoying. I mean, but I'm grateful for it. I'm not talking about books I've not read. I'm not talking about papers I've not read. Whether I agree with them or not actually isn't the point. Uh, there are quite a few books that I would read that I would say are actually evil books. Donald Trump, when he was in a divorce with his first wife, she said he has a copy of Mein Kampf next to his bed. I wish more people did. If the German people had bothered to read that book rather than just have it on their shelf, we might have avoided the Holocaust. If more people read the Quran, they'd be wiser to what Islam actually is, what they actually believe. If people bothered to read, as I have, the writings of Klaus Schwab and the various contributors to the World Economic Forum and the ideas that are driving the globalists, I read them because I want to understand their mentality. I cut out the middleman. I go straight to the ideology. Everything in your life is being defined by either your ideas or the ideas of the people around you. And each episode, we're gonna be digging into a different idea that appears in the culture. This is Ideas Have Consequences with me, Larry Alex Taunton. Okay, so I am here at Target in Tampa, Florida. Just walked in the door. You've heard that there's a backlash and that Target's made some real changes. Uh, to their very aggressive pride display uh, this year. And you have been lied to, actually. Because right here at the very front of the building, there you go. There's your little, little toddler mannequin. And it gets better. Check this out. So, uh, they also have plenty of toddler gear, plenty of onesies for literally 12. 12 months, that's what that is. And then they have this designer. See that? This is designed by the now infamous Satanic Company. The guy that says, we're hanging with Satan because Satan respects pronouns. This is his brand. Look it up, right here at the front of the store, along with the child mannequin. Don't believe the lies. Uh, Target has gotten rid of nothing. And if anything, it's worse than I could have possibly imagined. I mean, People want to understand what's going on with, say, Target. You know, you see Benny Johnson, you know, wandering around in Target looking at the, what's it called, the tuck, you know, the tuck swimsuit. People are trying to understand what's, what's going on when corporations are alienating their, um, you know, customer base. You know, why would the NFL, you know, Joe Sixpack loves the NFL and the NFL starts pushing um, the, you know, the Rainbow Mafia, forcing it on their viewers. What's going on with that? It feels even, you know, somewhat anti-American, you know, some of the stuff that they're doing. The Dodgers, the Dodgers. I mean, does it get, you know, we even, we even have a slogan, you know, how about them Dodgers? I mean, the Dodgers are about as American as apple pie. And here are the Dodgers with their, you know, again, alphabet, alphabet mafia, you know, um, you know, night at the stadium where they're attacking nuns and they're calling nuns hateful because of their position, a biblical position and a correct position, a moral position on homosexuality, on so-called trans rights, and all this kind of stuff. The Dodgers more or less declare um, open day, you know, on the nuns with all the nonsense they're doing. Um, and 
you have SoFi has managed to escape a lot of this because I listen to a fair amount of um, Sirius Satellite Radio, and there has there has been a commercial that they're pushing where a woman comes on and she says, Amanda is making changes in her life. And then Amanda comes on and says something like, I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to get rid of that. But Amanda is a man. So again, SoFi is, you know, giving uh, a, a woman's name to a man all the way through this commercial. And by the way, I've written to you, SoFi, to your media account, and I've asked you for an explanation as to why you're pushing this nonsense. I'm waiting for a response. So far, I've heard nothing from you. So you have that going on. ESPN has offed, you know, in Hitman style, almost every host I won't say he was conservative. Maybe they had a few who are conservative who made their way over to Fox, uh, Fox Sports. But even anybody who just felt like they were more old school, they just got rid of them all, keeping you know Mike Greenberg, who I don't like, and getting rid of Mike Golick, just because Mike Golick, uh, I don't think Mike Golick's particularly ideological, but he wasn't a guy who was necessarily you know going to push the way uh, Mike Greenberg did. And then, you know, you have all these other figures, you know, and then of course, Disney. So you, you have all these companies who are doing this. And the question becomes, the question that I hear from so many people is why would these companies alienate their customer base? Well, it all has to do, it all has to do with something called ESG, which I'm going to get around to in just a moment. This episode is sponsored by Tome, where successful people grow. Tome produces world-class courses that are designed to help you flourish. Their courses are taught by expert speakers, influencers, business leaders, entrepreneurs, athletes, artists, doctors, theologians, and faith leaders. They're real people with years of experience in their fields who bring their best knowledge to each course. Tome is launching a brand new product that will elevate your learning experience on June 13th. To register for the upcoming launch, go to launch.tomeapp.com and enter my code, Larry T, for some exclusive access to amazing content. Let's first begin with, before we get to you know, the cultural aspects of this, the economic aspects of this, let's just very briefly address the science of transgenderism. There is no such thing as transgenderism. You cannot transcend your sexuality. It is a non-category. It is a non-word. There are only people who want to pretend that they are female or want to pretend that they are male or non-binary or whatever it is they want to call themselves, and then they want to force the rest of us to go along with their fantasy. My advice to you is refuse to play the game, refuse to enter in to their alternate universe. Anyway, I was reading a medical journal, and Michelle Cretello, who's the former president of the National College of Pediatricians, she addressed the science, and she said this, to be clear, this alternate perspective of an innate gender fluidity arising from prenatally feminized or masculinized brains trapped in the wrong body is an ideological belief that has no basis in rigorous science. A teleological, which is to say a purposeful, view of human sexuality is at least drawn with reference to biological reality. The norm for human design is to be conceived either male or female. Sex chromosomes pair XY and XX. They're genetic markers of sex, male and female, respectively. They're not genetic markers of a disorder or of a birth defect. Human sexuality is binary, by design, with the purpose being the reproduction of our species. This principle is self-evident. Barring one of the rare disorders of sex development, no infant is assigned a sex at birth. Rather, birth sex declares itself automatically in utero and is only acknowledged at birth. Now that's that's that really really nails it. We are we are not assigning sex at birth. No one assigns sex at birth. It happens automatically in utero and we're merely acknowledging the reality of that. I remember when my oldest son Michael was born, the 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 doctor lifting him 
and, and holding him for me and saying, this one has outdoor plumbing. <laughs> um, Lori and I didn't, you know, we didn't know. We didn't know what, what his sex was going to be. He didn't say, well, we don't know what this one is yet. This is yet to be assigned. It's yet to be determined. No, it's clear right there. And um, so the question becomes, why? There are two questions here. The first, why are companies... Bud Light, I failed to mention Bud Light. Why are companies deliberately forcing on their customers something they know they're not going to like? Why are they forcing the ideology? And the second question is, why this sexual ideology? Well, let's, let's, let's address the sexual ideology um, first. These are old Marxist tactics. They're old Marxist tactics. Doesn't mean that everybody who is forcing these um, issues is a Marxist or even knows who Karl Marx was or has any idea that they're employing Marxist taxic, tactics. But that's what this is. Um, these are old Marxist tactics. This isn't new. This predated Marx. War over language, the... the determination to make you use the quote-unquote preferred pronouns of other people is an effort to control thought, which is a fundamentally Marxist and fascist thing to do. It's the first assault on free speech. It isn't to suppress what you're saying. That comes later. It's simply to make you say what they want you to say. It's to make you participate in their false reality. That's, that's what that's about. So these kind of tactics are all about disruption. So while the average American is thinking, well, this must be about, this must be about Black Lives Matter. This must be about, this must be about racism because they're toppling statues of, of people who are slave owners. But then they started toppling statues of abolitionists. Tucker Carlson wondered aloud on air before Fox drove him out. Um, what's going on here? I mean, we thought this was about racism. And so you're always trying to address what they don't like, never understanding that they're never going to agree with you. They're always going to be moving the goalpost, and it's because it's not actually about rights. It's about the seizure of power. It's about disrupting absolutely everything within society and destroying it. This is the way socialists, which is another way of saying Marxists, have always operated. And I want to be clear on, on this point for some uh, who don't understand this. I, I've, I've used some terms here that I should define. Marxism is a particular strain of socialism. So by definition, all Marxists are socialists. But not all socialists are Marxists. There are different strains of socialism. There's Leninism, there's Stalinism, which are kind of variants actually on Marxism. There's Titoism. You know, it just, it, it, it kind of goes on and on and on. It is an ideology of the left. But its evil twin is fascism. And fascism is actually very important to our discussion because it's what we're seeing right now when we're talking about Target and this sort of thing, as you'll see in just a moment. Fascism is also an ideology of the left. Now, I know that many of you were taught, I was taught, that fascism is an ideology of the right. It isn't. It isn't. It cannot be. And it's because, it's because capitalists uh, believe in free markets. Capitalists believe in uh, minimum regulation on the economy. Fascism basically looks just like Marxism. In terms of, from the perspective of the governed, they are the same. The, the absolute power of the secret police, the absolute power of the state, oppression, mass surveillance, control, 
uh, utterly godless. Both are atheistic to their core. But the key difference is this. From a Marxist point of view, the means of production are owned by the state. That is to say, all industry is owned, but there's no private property in a Marxist, in a socialist economy. Fascism allows for um, private property. However, it is directed, its use is directed by the state. So a traditional definition of, of fascism looks something like this. It's strict regimentation of the economy for the purpose of war. So to use the most famous fascist of all, Adolf Hitler, um, Adolf Hitler was regimenting the economy, regulating it in such a way that said, Porsche, yeah, you're, you're private. However, you'll make tanks for the Wehrmacht. Um, BMW, you will make planes for the Luftwaffe. And, uh, and so a Volkswagen, you'll, you'll make tanks. Yeah, they directed the use of that private property, you see. They controlled its use. Now, you probably see where I'm headed with this because this is what we're seeing in the economy now. And it comes back to our question that we asked at the very beginning. Why would Target make bikinis for men? Why would Target be pushing trans ideology with children? Why would Chick-fil-A... There's an embarrassing video. We should probably take a second. In fact, I want to take a second to watch this. We'll watch it in just a minute. We'll get to it. It's a video of Dan Cathy, you know, shining the shoes of people. We'll come to this in a minute. But why are these companies doing this and alienating their customer base? Well, the, the reason they're doing it is because, uh, in some cases, there may be marketers or people within the, um, the corporations who actually believe it. And hence, they're committed to the ideology and they're pushing it because they themselves believe in the ideology. But I, that's not the primary reason. The, the, I believe that what's happening here is this is ESG. Now, you maybe have heard Elon Musk say that ESG is of the devil. He hates it. And uh, it is because Elon Musk uh, has been the victim of ESG. They kicked him, they, they kicked Tesla off of the S&P 500 in, uh, I think, last year. And the result was that Tesla's stock dropped by 55%. They have the power to do this. So let's take a case like Bud Light. You can almost feel sorry for them. They're in a very difficult position. And uh, it seems that since they have no real core convictions of their own, it's made all the harder. But on the one hand, Bud Light knows that their customer base, these are red staters, you know, for the most part. These are, these are football watching, America loving uh, people who are barbecuing on July the 4th and uh, shooting fireworks. That's Bud Light's base. So they come along and they put Dylan Mulvaney on a can and they start pushing all this kind of stuff. Their customers, which they knew this was going to happen, they knew they weren't going to be able to fly under the radar with this. They react. But, I mean, you probably have seen the, um, the footage of um, steamrollers going over their stuff. You've seen uh, over, you know, case after case after case of Bud Light. You've seen the pictures of grocery stores where the Miller Lite is gone and, you know, Coors is gone, but Bud Light is still sitting there. So as of yesterday, $27 billion they've lost. So what's happening? Well, you see, Bud Light finds themselves in this weird position, this difficult position, where on the one hand, the ideologues, the fascists, who give the ESG ratings are saying to corporate America with a gun to the head, you will push all of this ideology. You will do this. Or 
You'll suffer the consequences because we will downgrade you on your ESG rating. And ESG stands for Environmental, um, Social, and Corporate Governance. So Environmental, Social, and Governance, ESG. And what that is is these are three lanes in which your company is evaluated and judged and you're given, it's a social credit system for corporations. They want to bring it to you to you as a person, individually. They don't, they're not just satisfied in doing this with corporations. They want to do it with, with individuals as well. You, we'll all get an ESG at some point if we're not careful. But they judge your company, and you say, well, who cares? I, I don't care what they think. My customers will still buy my product. Oh, you will care. Because, as I noted, as uh, Elon Musk discovered, they kicked him off the S&P 500, and the result was his stock valuation crashed. So they have this ability to force this. And then you have you know, somebody like uh, Larry Fink, who's the CEO of BlackRock, which is a multi, I think, trillion dollar company. And you say, well, who's, who's BlackRock? Well, BlackRock owns a lot of these companies, or at least owns a portion of these companies. And Larry Fink, who is, by the way, and we're going to get to this eventually, he is a member of the, can you guess, the World Economic Forum. The World Economic Forum. Guys like him. He is a member of the World Economic Forum, and here's a guy who says we have to force behavior. You can find this in a, on YouTube, an interview he gave, and I think he says that phrase at least three times in the interview. Force behavior, force behavior, force behavior. He's basically saying ignore the customers. We don't care what they think. Ignore the shareholders. We don't care what they think. We need to push this ideology because, and you can, you can hear the smugness in Fink's voice as though he holds a moral high ground. We need, to, we need to force companies to do this and to change their policies and push this radical leftist ideology because it's the right thing to do. Even if we suffer consequences financial consequences for this. So this is what they're pushing. So ESG, we're putting a gun to your head, Bud Light. We're putting a gun to your head, Target. We're putting a gun to your head, Chick-fil-A. All these different companies, and you will do this or you will suffer the consequences. So, so on the one hand, Target, Bud Light, NFL, the Dodgers, MLB, they know that they're going to lose billions one way or the other. They can't win. Alienate the customers or pander to the ESG crowd, which is to say to pander to the left. And they've almost all chosen to pander to the left. You know, Chick-fil-A is a, actually a unique instance in all of this. Um, years ago... I was speaking at a youth retreat in the mountains of Tennessee, and I get a call from CNN saying, can you come on TV today to do an interview with us and to defend Chick-fil-A? Those of you who are listening, watching, may recall that Chick-fil-A in, I'm not sure what year this was, but Chick-fil-A was under fire for their pro-traditional family views, which were rooted in, in an unabashed Christianity at the time. And they weren't being protested by, uh, um, by trans people at the time. It was homosexuals who were you know, out in front of Chick-fil-A uh, restaurants in an effort to, this was an early effort to cancel them. And then Mike Huckabee, governor of Arkansas, Mike Huckabee came out and said, hey, Chick-fil-A Appreciation Day. You remember that? And he declared the Chick-fil-A Appreciation Day. And, um, and the effort by the left to cancel Chick-fil-A, which at the time was very, very Christian in their approach and, and in their stated objectives, you know, closed on Sundays, it's Lord's Day, Chick-fil-A, it failed. They failed in canceling Chick-fil-A. Didn't work because people lined up around the block to order some. It's the easiest, tastiest protest ever. 
You just went to Chick-fil-A and you order a combo meal and eat some waffle fries for Jesus. I mean, this is what happened. And so CNN calls me and says, hey, can you come on air and to defend Chick-fil-A? And I said, love to, glad to do that. So I went to the University of Tennessee, which is where they told me to go so that I could be patched in live uh, into um, to this show, this conversation. And I defended Chick-fil-A's policy. Here's the interesting thing to come, come back to this. I never received so much as a waffle fry from Chick-fil-A for doing that. You would think that somebody at Chick-fil-A would have written a note and said, hey, thank you so much for defending us. <laughs> I didn't get a gift card. I didn't hear from them. The point isn't that, um, that they owed me a, a, you know, a, a, a gift card. The point is that you would think there would be somebody on Chick-fil-A's side who would express gratitude that you have defended them in the public space, even though I had no dog in the fight. I don't own, I don't own anything of, of, that's Chick-fil-A. But that right there already signaled me that things were changing at Chick-fil-A. That is to say that they didn't necessarily appreciate the defense because they were maybe, no pun intended, waffling on their own position. And why I think Chick-fil-A is, a, is a unique in this is because, let's watch this video of Dan Cathy. I'm, I'm going to make, make a point here. Let's, let's watch this little video of Dan Cathy from a couple of years ago where he says something I just think is astonishing. A story that was shared with me by a dear friend who shared with me about a revival that was taking place at a church in Texas. And uh, at that revival on the front seat was an older African-American, young, uh, older African-American man, man that was sitting there. And this young man got up that uh, was there in that service and he'd been so gripped with conviction about the racism that was in that local community in a small town in Texas that he, he took a, uh, a shoe brush and he walked over to this elderly gentleman and he knelt on his knees and began to shine his shoes. And uh, tears began to flow uh, in that service. Uh, it was an attitude of, uh, of conviction. So I, I invite folks to just to, to put some words to action here. And if we need to find somebody that needs to have their shoe shine, we need to just go right on over and shine their shoes. And uh, whether they got tennis shoes on or not, maybe they got sandals on, it really doesn't matter. But there, there's a time in which we need to have, you know, some, some personal action here. Maybe we need to give them a hug, too, <laughs> brother. And some, and some, and some stock in Chick-fil-A. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, <laughs> I, I bought about 1,500 of these, and I gave to all our Chick-fil-A operators and staff a number of years ago. And uh, so any expressions of a contrite heart, of a sense of humility, a sense of shame, a sense of embarrassment, uh, begin with an apologetic heart. I think that's... Okay. So here is Dan Cathy. Here is Dan Cathy... It's cringy watching this video. Now, whatever Dan Cathy's intentions, I have no reason to believe he isn't sincere here. We see him going over to this man who looks uncomfortable. This black man he is watching Dan Cathy, you know, brush his sneakers. And I thought his comment was pretty funny. You know, well, you know, instead of that, how about some, how about some stock in Chick Fil A? One of the things I have often said about Marxism is this: that the kind of tactics that are being employed in the United States right now work best in a Christian culture, or let me put it this way: they work best in a a a marginally Christian culture, a culture that, that is kind of running on the fumes of Christianity, but is not still deeply rooted in the Bible. So what we see from Dan Cathy here isn't proper Christian sentiment, 
It's sentimentality. It's Christian-ish behavior. And he's treating it as though it's like a foot washing ceremony, that what I'm doing is very Christ-like. And then he, what did he say, he bought like 12, 1,500 of these brushes and sent them out to all of their um, restaurant owners. If, if I get that brush, I might use it to, for my own shoes. I might use it to, um, to brush the dog, but I'm not going to go around. To, and what did he say? He said that it needs to be with, um, it needs to be with humility, shame, shame. Embarrassment, humility, shame, embarrassment, and apologetic heart, which is the uh, the wrong word, but anyway, humility, shame, and embarrassment. I don't feel I don't feel any of those things as regards whatever social ill he thinks he is addressing and in some way correcting by this obsequious behavior. It's it's cringy. And it's annoying because no one in that room was a victim of slavery. Dan Cathy, presumably, is not responsible for anyone's enslavement. I'm not. I think of my wife. She's white. Her family came to this country in the 1930s. <laughs> I have a thing to do with that. And they were trying to escape the evils of Adolf Hitler. I mean, you know, there are escaping social ills there. We can just keep going back in everyone's family and find social ills or people who were responsible for social ills against other people. Uh, our adopted daughter, Sasha, she's white. She came to this country in 2009, and she came here as a result of massive abuse and corruption in the Ukraine. She has nothing to do with any of that. So what we're seeing with Chick-fil-A is very different from what we're seeing, say, with Target. At least I think it is. It's very different from what we're seeing with Target or with the Dodgers, or which may be because they really believe in the ideology, or maybe because they're getting pressure, ESG type of pressure. Chick-fil-A has been co-opted into the trans movements because Marxism Marxism has the ability, Marxist tactics, it, it is one of the most um, chameleon-like ideologies. It is, it is constantly changing itself. So it's a shapeshifter. And, you know, what's that game? What's that game kids play, the, 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 the shapeshifters? Fortnite. Is it Fortnite that, that, that does that? Anyway, it is a, it is a shapeshifting ideology. And uh, it has the ability to, as I say, sock puppet almost anything. And it's why I highly recommend reading this book by Fedor Dostoevsky, Demons, sometimes translated as The Possessed. There's a bit of a translation argument about the Russian and its meaning or Dostoevsky's meaning because Dostoevsky was writing about socialism. He was writing about, it wasn't yet so much Marxism, but he was writing about the evil of socialism and the people who are pushing it. And he says they're demons. So the question, you know, in the translation is, you know, the one translation says the possessed, meaning that the socialists themselves are possessed by demons. And Dostoevsky, some say, no, no, that's not what he meant. He meant that they are the possessing agent. The, you, know, you hear a lot of people say that what we're seeing is demonic. It is demonic. This ideology is demonic. It is fundamentally godless. But you see, because it plays on what feels like moral sentiments, a lot of Christians get seduced by it. Because you see, they come along and they say, so, so you don't love trans people? You don't love homosexuals? You don't think they deserve rights? And I think the average Christian goes, well, I mean, I believe in rights. I believe in freedom. I believe in love. Love wins. I believe in that. Any Christian, truly Christian sentiment can be hijacked and made evil. There is a place for hate. The Lord tells us to hate sin. There's a place for it. There is a place for anger. This has been forgotten. 
Scripture says, be angry and do not sin, meaning there are some things. If you aren't outraged by the transing, by the, the <laughs> sexual mutilation of adolescence, there's something wrong with you. If you are not angered by the annihilation of the unborn, there's something wrong with you. If you are not angered by the destruction of the rule of law, there's something wrong with you. These things should anger you. A lot of Christians have been taught there's no place for anger. There's no place for violence. There is a place for violence. Let me repeat that. There is a place for violence within the Christian faith. Just this month, we are celebrating the 79th anniversary of the Normandy invasion, D-Day, Operation Overlord, where American, British, Canadian, Polish, French soldiers landed on those beaches and ultimately liberated Europe. That wasn't going to happen singing Kumbaya. It required violence in order to achieve it. A quotation that is often attributed to George Orwell, wrongly, he didn't say it, but I'm sure he wished that he did. It's a brilliant quotation, which is this, men and women sleep peaceably in their bed at night because rough men stand ready to do violence on their behalf. That's how the sausage is made, ladies and gentlemen. You have freedom because the currency of freedom is blood. I love the way Pericles put it, the Athenian statesman and the funeral oration in 431 BC. He said, happiness depends on freedom and freedom depends on courage. So any Christian sentiment can be hijacked and perverted. Hate can be perverted. Love can be perverted. There's a proper place for it. But see, a lot of Christians today believe Love has no boundaries. There are some things you shouldn't love. Some people you should not love. Some things you should not love. Your love can become misplaced. Homosexual love is wrong. It's sin. It's evil. Loving transing children, that's evil. So what has happened, I think, with what you're seeing with somebody like Dan Cathy, and I don't mind picking on Dan Cathy because this is just disgusting. Dan, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? Shining the shoes of people? Sending? You want all your operators to, to go out and shine the shoes of black people? How absolutely condescending is that? That actually feels kind of racist to me. It, it does because it feels like you're... You know, you're thinking, first of all, that you can address societal ills, you know, with a brush. You can literally sweep it away. Second of all, it kind of is, comes off sort of feeling like I'm sort of better than you. Look, look at how I humble myself. Look at how humble I am, how I do this. So disgusting. But in contrast to Bud Light... And in contrast to Target and the MLB and uh, uh, the NFL and on and on and on, I think Dan Cathy thinks that what he's doing is actually quite Christian. He'd just as well be shining the feet of Nebuchadnezzar's image that's 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. You are, you are shining the feet of an idol. I don't mean that, that black people are an idol, the, the, the person in... Uh, in uh, specifically, rather, I mean, it is an ideology that you are embracing and you are shining it off and giving it more life in the culture. Well, you should stand your ground and say, no, no, we don't owe you anything. We don't owe you anything. I don't feel that 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 Ukraine owes my daughter. I mean, they do in the sense that it is an evil country that somehow has been you know, portrayed as, as a beacon of freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, I promise you it isn't. I've been there almost 10 times. And uh, in the adoption of, uh, of our daughter, uh, we had to bribe every single official but one. <laughs> it's incredible. Every single official but one. They were also utterly corrupt. Their treatment of orphan children is astonishingly evil. I don't know of anyone who suffered more than my daughter. No one. And I've met a lot of people who have suffered. A lot in the third world. But Sasha doesn't act like people owe her a thing. 
she just moves on with her life. Um, my wife's grandparents, you know, who came to this country from Germany, they got on with life. They got on with farming. They got on with families. They got on with faith. They haven't lived lives of resentment that the world owed them. They just simply moved on and looked to eternity where these things will be addressed. So I think that what you're seeing from the woke church and from woke, quote-unquote, Christian corporations is you're seeing them being guilted into believing that if they're really Christians, they'll do these kinds of things. And that's because Marxists rely on guilt. They weaponize guilt. They have none themselves. It, what's funny is that Dan Cathy says, again, remind me, it's, it's shame, it's embarrassment, and humility. Marxists have none of these things, but they will absolutely leverage them against you. They will leverage all of that against you, not for the sake of, they don't want you to shine their shoes. They want power. That's what they want. They want power. It's about the destruction. I love the way Alexander Solzhenitsyn put it. Um, he said this in a speech in New York in 1975. He said, the communist, which is you know, Marxist, socialist, the communist ideology is to destroy your social order. This has been their aim for 125 years, and it has never changed. Let me repeat that. The communist ideology is to destroy your social order. This has been their aim for 125 years, and it has never changed. It's talking about those wrenches. It's about disrupting your social order and throwing wrenches into the smooth-running American machine. And that's socially, economically, politically, destroying them all as much as possible in order to replace it with something else. And by the way, what they'll replace it with will not be with trans types. Those will be the first people lined up against a the wall. They're happy to use them. They realized Antonio Gramsci, who's a, an Italian Marxist of the 1930s, who's imprisoned by Mussolini, which kind of makes him a hero in the minds of some people. But he's no better than Mussolini. He was a Marxist. He was a communist. Hardcore. And Antonio Gramsci wrote these little secret notebooks in which he said that the Marxist tactic of overthrowing a culture through what I'll call, I think he called it a war of, um, um, I forget the way he put it, but anyway, a frontal assault, which is to say with pitchforks and, and uh, guns, to overthrow a society that way, he says, isn't going to work in the West. And he says, the reason it won't work is because the working class does not, does not seethe with resentment the way they did in Russia, the way they did in much of Africa and South America and Asia. They didn't seethe with resentment towards the government. And that's because people could move up. You work hard in America and you could move up the the the. Uh, social ladder. Your children could go to college. S successive generations of my own family have done a little bit better than the ones before them. My great-grandparents were sharecroppers. I've seen pictures of them. My great-grandfather is standing practically barefoot with a rope as a belt. And this is in the 1930s, in, you know, during the Great Depression, where it's clear they had almost nothing. I've seen the house. The house is nothing like the houses that I've lived in or raised in. Even the ones that I've considered not to be particularly nice were all way better than this kind of, you know, one, maybe two bedroom, you know, house is tiny with no, no um, aesthetic value at all. They're sharecroppers, which is a kind of slavery. They're like serfs, like peasants, essentially. My father went just a little bit better. Join the army. Three square meals a day. He could move up. Provided for his family. I'm the first to go to college uh, that I know of in my, my family tree on his side. My own children will excel 
are excelling, um, what I myself was able to achieve, meaning the baton was handed off and each successive generation went just a little further. That was America. That's historically been America. Same is true for my wife's family. Gramsci said, it's for that reason that we can't destroy the society with a frontal assault. We have to instead destroy it by turning people against each other, breaking society down, what's called intersectionality. An element of intersectionality is critical race theory. We turn people against each other. We turn white people against black people, men against women, wives against their husbands, uh, children against their parents. Have you, are you seeing this? Where there's a lot of discussion about parental rights in school? It's because the goal is to weaponize your children against you. This is all part of the Marxist tactic that is ultimately about power. It is about power. So ESG is just another element of this. And ESG is actually fascist because it's the weaponizing of the economy against a domestic population. That's how we're seeing that work. You don't like what Bud Light's doing. They don't care. You're a stockholder with Target. They don't care. And it's because this is part of something called that they call stakeholder capitalism. Have you heard that term, stakeholder capitalism? Klaus Schwab, who is the, um, the founder and the sole chairman of the World Economic Forum, you know, the German who says, we will build the future. <laughs> he sounds, sounds like a Bond villain. It looks like a Bond villain. You just need him petting a cat. You should picture him sitting there petting a cat. He's been using that phrase for decades. And the way stakeholder capitalism works is this. And, and by the way, a word you should pay very close attention to that is used in the culture, which is your enemy. When you, when you, you hear this word being used, you need to know that it is your enemy. It is so nothing good is coming out of this for you. It is the word sustainability. Whenever you hear the word sustainability, there's an interesting little film that uh, that we've you know we've enjoyed. Didn't do well at the box office, but it's Cameron Diaz and um, what's his name, Tom Cruise. Yeah, Cameron Diaz and Tom Cruise, and it's called Night and Day. Night and Day. And he tells Cameron Diaz, what's well, this kind of a spy spoof comedy adventure, kind of fun. But he tells Cameron Diaz, he says, look, when the FBI arrests you, you need to run if you ever hear them use the phrase safe, the situation is controlled. We're going to take you to a safe place. <laughs> well, it's funny that it's the FBI because the, the FBI has been weaponized against the American people. The FBI used to be, you know, those were the white knights of American law enforcement for decades. That was their reputation. The word now, you need to run, is sustainability. When you hear sustainability, ESG, DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, and um, what's another one of their, oh, stakeholder capitalism. When you, when you hear that, you need to know that nothing good is coming after that because the way stakeholder capitalism works is this. Traditional capitalism, Ludwig von Mises, the economist, he made the observation 100% correct. Milton Friedman would, would agree with this, that capitalism by definition is driven by the customers and shareholders. That it is the it is the responsibility of companies to please their shareholders. And the way you do that is by servicing your customers, providing them what they want. And part of the confusion that people are seeing in all this is they're going, why is Target doing what they're doing? Why is Chick-fil-A doing what they're doing? Why are the Dodgers doing? They're alienating their customer base because stakeholder capitalism works differently than that. It's not real capitalism. It actually is a kind of um, fascism. It's what I'll call economic fascism. 
And the way that works is this, is you ignore your stockholders, you ignore your customers, and you instead lean into the stakeholders. And the stakeholders are various elements of society that demand that you use your company in such a way that it is for the benefit, not really, but it is for the benefit of the common good. So way we're going to judge you in stakeholder capitalism is with ESG, environmental, social, and corporate governance. We're going to, we're going to evaluate you in each one of those lanes. And if you start tilting towards pleasing your customer base, we're going to hammer you. In fact, I've been, I've been wondering this, this past week, Jamel Hill, who is full of hate. I liked Jamel Hill when she was at ESPN. I, you, I used to see her on a show I liked at the time called Mike and Mike, and she seemed like a pleasant woman. She had good insights and so forth. But the real Jamel Hill has come out. At that time at ESPN, I guess she couldn't say everything that she wanted to say. And um, now she does. And Jamel Hill is a racist. She is basically the black equivalent of the KKK. It's what she is. She is full of hate. And Jamel Hill told Spotify that they were racist if they did not pay her or another black host the same amount of money that they just signed Joe Rogan to. Joe Rogan just signed a contract with Spotify for $100 million. And you know what Spotify did? They did what they should have done. They said, you're fired, Jamel Hill. We're not going to pay you $100 million. We're not going to pay you anything. (laughs) We're going to fire you. But I'm interested to see what's going to happen here because... Spotify, which I'm assuming is a publicly held company, is likely to get leaned on very heavily by the ESG mob, by the stakeholder capitalism mob, which is to say by the left. Because you know what's happened to to Bud Light? Bud Light has lost not just billions of dollars, but see, now they're getting hammered by the SG people because you would think that the SG crowd, the stakeholder capitalism crowd would say, good for you, Bud Light. You did the moral thing. But see, they now have said to them that they're removing their rating because they didn't like Bud Light's response. They said, you had a chance right here, a moment where you could have demonstrated your commitment to the alphabet mafia, and you failed. So in addition to the loss of your billions of dollars, we're now going to remove your social rating. Same thing is happening to Target. Targets lost billions. They realized, oh my heavens, this is a, you know, we're creating an economic crater within our own company. They began taking down all the displays, getting rid of the tuck swimsuits, all this kind of stuff. So now what has happened is they're getting hammered by the stakeholder capitalist crowd, which is to say the radical left, who are now boycotting Target. So on the one side, it was the conservatives who boycotted them when they were doing all the radical leftist stuff. They remove it, but because they've removed it, now the radical left is boycotting them and um, hammering their social credit rating. So this is why, so for those of you who are out there who are wondering why these companies are doing these things, it seems irrational to you, but there is a logic to this that they are following, an immoral logic, but there is a logic that they are following. These companies feel that they're, in some cases, they are stuck in the middle and they can't win. They're going to lose billions either way. I will say this, there is some hope that if enough companies refuse to play along with the ESG uh, mafia, there is some hope that... ESG itself, the whole system itself could collapse. Whether or not it does, I don't know. It feels to me like with the support of BlackRock and various others, Disney, with all the money that is behind ESG, 
Uh, it seems like this is coming and it's coming in a, in a very big way, but we are seeing some resistance. I'll give you a little behind the scenes, you know, discussion I had with, um, Dinesh D'Souza. Dinesh is a, is a good friend of mine. I've known him for, for many years and, um, this whole ESG thing is quite disturbing. And the question becomes, you know, what can I do when you see these kinds of ideologies being forced on you by major corporations that you otherwise have, you know, happily patronized? What can be done? Well, I started reflecting on what a group of just a few thousand Reddit users did to Wall Street, the major banks at Wall Street they resented the fact that they were, you know, they basically, the, 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 these Wall Street banks were fixing the rules in their favor and they shorted GameStop's stock. And what these Reddit users did, not very many of them, they drove up the value on GameStop hugely, hugely. And the result was that many of these Wall Street banks lost billions. They lost billions as a result of just a small organized effort by a bunch of well-organized Reddit users. So anyway, I, uh, I call up Dinesh and I say, would it be possible, would it be possible to punish some of these companies that are forcing this kind of ideology with a GameStop-like effort. I mean, because I know many of you are asking, you know, what can you do? And we started discussing this and whatever the possibilities are. And one of the major concerns we both had was how do you organize people? How do you organize conservatives? Uh, the, I think we're seeing a situation in the United States where it's the tail wagging the dog. I, the majority of people in this country don't believe in trans ideology. They don't buy into that nonsense. I don't believe that. The problem is the left is highly, highly organized in what they're doing here. And they are taking your money that you invest in these companies like Google, like Disney, like Coca-Cola, which are all radically leftist now. And uh, Google has been from its beginning, but Coca-Cola and Disney uh, certainly were not. And Target and Bud Light and BlackRock and on and on and on. They're using that money against you to force their ideology on you. How do we organize conservatives? And we both kind of came to the conclusion, it's like trying to herd cats. I mean, you can see on Twitter, you know, for instance, and, you know, and, and Twitter is, you know, what it is, but you will see people arguing over, you know, fine points of theology. And you're thinking, hey, guys, there's a, <laughs> there's a bigger fight that's going on over here while you're arguing, you know, um, among, you know, which brand of Calvinism you choose to buy into or you're arguing over, um, you know, baptism or sprinkling, you know, or this kind of thing, there's something bigger that's going on. And my point isn't that those issues don't matter. I believe theology matters. The, the fine points lead to the, to the bigger points. But we have to be paying attention to what's happening in, in the broader culture. And um, we have to organize ourselves to push back. What is encouraging to me about what is happening right now is that I don't think the Black Rocks of the world believed that conservatives were going to push back on them to this degree. I think Bud Light thought they would lose some money. But I think that they chose, again, in a forced choice situation, we either go for the better, the higher ESG rating, or we seek to please our customers. And in that situation, they chose ESG. And I believe they chose ESG because they thought it was the least painful thing they could do. They knew there was going to be pain in this, but they thought it would be the least painful thing that they could do. It turned out to be the more painful one because of how much money they've lost. And the same is true with Target. They've lost so much. And that's encouraging to me because conservatives are starting to find some organization and they're starting to realize we do have some cloud in this. 
I love Chick-fil-A sandwiches. Won't be eating them anytime soon. I'll go somewhere else. I'll give my money somewhere else. I regret having defended you on CNN, Dan Cathy. You didn't deserve it. You didn't deserve it. What you did, what you did in that video where you're brushing the shoes of that man, it's embarrassing. I'm embarrassed for you. But it was a, a pandering, ass-kissing move. That's all it was. That wasn't Christian. What doctrine are you looking at for that? By what authority, what scriptural authority do you tell Christians that they should feel shame and embarrassment? I feel shame and embarrassment for my personal sins, not for yours. And I feel shame and embarrassment for my own sins up to the point that the Lord forgives me for those sins. And then I move on with my life as I'm called to do. ESG, there is nothing, nothing Christian about woke ideology. And that is because, and it is important that you understand this, as I told a, a seminary professor, I was speaking to his class, and it was astonishing what I <clears throat> encountered in his class. But here he is, a seminary professor, preparing future ministers of the gospel. And I realized, oh, maybe halfway into my lecture, that this man was not preparing future ministers of the gospel. He was preparing future social justice warriors. And ladies and gentlemen, so that you understand, they are not the same thing. The gospel is about grace. It is about redemption. It is about restoration. Woke ideology is about retribution. It's about accusation. It's not about restoration. It's not about grace. It's not about forgiveness. The two are very, very different. And this man was, was preparing future, not, not agents of, of the gospel, but agents of retribution. One is filled with love and grace and mercy and the other with hate. They have no, there, there's, there's no place for that in the church. It has no foundation within scripture, none whatsoever. So when I see Dan Cathy behaving the way Dan Cathy was behaving, I just look at that and I think, I feel embarrassment for you, not for myself, because there's nothing Christian in what you're doing. Ladies and gentlemen, the direction that we're headed, the direction that we're headed right now with ESG, stakeholder capitalism, pushing sexual anarchy, I wrote, I think it was for CNN, I'm not sure, but I wrote maybe uh, a decade ago, however long it's been, that Jerry Sandusky, remember Jerry Sandusky, the, the um, assistant coach, the defensive coordinator for Penn State under Joe Paterno uh, for their football team, turned out that he was sexually molesting loads of children. I mean, sexually molesting them. And Jerry Sandusky is in prison. And I wrote a decade ago that the direction that our society is heading, pushing pedophilia, the time would come where Jerry Sandusky is viewed as a victim of heteronormativity. That he will be viewed as a guy who was acting on his natural and normal um, sexual impulses, his attraction for minors. Have you seen this thing called MAPS? Yes, it's, it's astonishing. It's, um, it's minor attracted persons. It's another way of, it's again, it's the war over language to control thought. They're pedophiles. But the pedophiles decided, ah, being labeled pedophiles isn't, isn't the best marketing. Let's call ourselves MAPS, Minor Attracted Persons. Jerry Sandusky will eventually be viewed, we're there, as simply a minor attracted person, not as a pedophile, but as a minor attracted person. Larry Nasser, 
the uh, physician at Michigan State who molested uh, a number of gymnasts, he will be viewed as a minor attracted person, not as a pedophile. These people will be seen as victims of a bigoted society who didn't see these people in their proper light. That's the direction that we're headed. People have learned that where they spend their dollars matters. They've learned this. They know. They've discovered with their coordinated efforts against Target, against Bud Light, against these various companies, that they have power. They have a voice in, uh, in what they're doing. Question becomes, what about small business owners? who are getting a lot of pressure. Some of those business owners, it's the same thing as at the higher level. Some of those are business owners who put out front their rainbow. I saw this in Seattle, you know, kind of at the beginning of all this. A lot of businesses had out front, this has been, how long ago was this? This was in 2015. I was there to debate Michael Shermer, atheist Michael Shermer at the concert hall in downtown Seattle. And you saw rainbow sidewalks and you saw rainbows in just about every business. And I asked one of the business owners, hey, what's up with, the, uh, with the, the rainbow thing there? And this particular business owner, I lucked upon a good one. This business owner indicated to me, well, it's extortion. It's protection money. They come into your business and they ask if you're supportive of the, the LGBTQ movement. And, uh, and if you say you're not, you can guarantee that they are going to desecrate your window, maybe smash your windows, maybe throw Molotov cocktails through your windows. So you make a contribution to them, and then they put a rainbow in your window. Now, does this sound vaguely familiar? It sounds like the opposite of the angel of death. It is... You know, instead, instead of putting, you know, the blood of the lamb, you know, over the doorpost and the angel of death passing over, I think Babylon B has done this. You know, they showed, you know, people putting rainbows over their doorways, you know, so that the LGBT mob would move on. Well, this is what was happening. Started in uh, places like Seattle and San Francisco, and they began moving out all over the place. But what it reminds me of, 1930s Germany, fascist. You so show your support by joining the Nazi party, wearing the pin or wearing the armband or putting a swastika in your window. And the, the, the brown shirts, the stormtroopers, will pass you by. They'll leave you alone. If you're not one of them, they might call you a Jew lover and this guy put a Star of David and then smash your window. So this is something that we've been seeing for quite a while. But I think that we are starting to see some businesses find their courage and that there are those who are pushing against this. If you're privately owned, you have more power. If you have stockholders, um, you, you have less. You have more bosses and you're able to, uh, to make fewer decisions on your own. Elon Musk is somebody to watch carefully in all this. Because Musk, you know, of course, owns several publicly owned companies. He's CEO, uh, he, you know, he runs several of these kinds of companies. And the guy is going to get pressure in all directions. And yet he's also indicated that he is, I mean, we saw recently how he made what is a woman a pinned tweet. And the result was that one in a, um, what is a woman ended up getting I don't know, 150, 200 million views. People were watching that after, after the debacle at Twitter where Twitter was suppressing it. And this is worth actually something worth commenting on right now. I've run a very small business, so I don't pretend to have Elon Musk's experience or his knowledge. But I know this much. If the people within your company, within your organization, are opposed to your mission statements, they can sink you. And what happened with what is a woman that wouldn't have happened in almost any other case, let's just say that we were putting out this podcast and somebody at Twitter was suppressing it, 
Would I have been able to get the attention of Elon Musk to address the issue? Almost certainly not. As it is, somebody at Twitter or some buddies at Twitter were suppressing that film, which was being released in its entirety on Twitter. They informed Daily Wire, Jeremy Boring, the CEO of, of Daily Wire, that they would not allow them to, pr um, to promote it and that they were gonna flag it as dangerous content, as hateful content. Jeremy Boring then put out a, a tweet thread in which he complained that Musk and Twitter, but he tagged Musk, that Musk and Twitter were suppressing their film. That got enough retweets that it eventually reached the level of Musk who saw it and said, this won't be allowed to stand, we will deal with this. And then you had some high level execs at Twitter um, resign or they were fired or something. The point is they're no longer there. But what about for the rest of us? You're not gonna get the notice of Elon Musk. Can Elon Musk address every one of these kind of concerns? He can't. He has to have people within his organization who share his ideological commitments. And what this demonstrated as he is he doesn't. He may have some in Twitter who do, but his other companies are not ideologically driven. Twitter is. And if he has, if 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 his staff at Twitter is shot through with rad radical leftists, he is gonna have a very, very hard time managing and changing this company. I believe he can do it. Um, you know, Musk has a lot of experience with this and he's been highly successful, but this has revealed there's still a major problem at Twitter.